there's certainly an element because Greeks and Romans were themselves so invested in hero culture in different ways, and they made their histories into kind of histories of heroes. So that that's another source of its appeal, I guess, and that and that that sense of loss. You know, we no longer live in a world that's dominated by great men who do great deeds. That's that certainly drives the American founders. You know, they wanted, they thought, here we are. I mean, we have the opportunity to be like them again, um, with mixed results. <laughs> right. They, the founders, Jefferson and Adams, being the most famous examples of this, are very classical and I would say specifically they're very Roman in the way they talk about their own failures at the end of their lives and they look back and say what we thought we'd put together is already falling apart and that uh, that classical sensibility that awareness of fallibility and the limits of human effort and human capacity and the limits of human virtue without giving into despair, but that awareness that's so keen and so much writing, and especially in Cicero, whom I've spent a lot of time thinking about, that uh, willingness to go public with that is something American politics seems to have lost um, since the early 19th century, and it is a real loss because it's as though the effort to create you know, the American project, to make the American project real, has has turned into an inability to admit failure, uh, or an inability to admit you know human fallibility or error. So in that sense, the you know, uh, American republicanism with a small R has left Roman republicanism really far behind, and I think lost something in that translation. Um, that check on um, on ambition and that check on self confidence and arrogance that tempers so much of Roman writing. Not all, <laughs> crucially, <laughs> but so much of it uh, is, is, is a dose of wisdom we could use today, for sure. I think right away of Cicero's last speeches uh, it, towards the end of his life, the speeches that are usually called Caesarian speeches that he gave in front of Caesar and in the Senate, uh, the most famous being the Pro Marcello, the, on behalf of Marcellus that he gave in 46, where he says, Cicero says, speaking to Caesar, who's at this point, you know, consolidated his basically kingly power, and the Senate, who's packed with Caesar's supporters and this little core of people who resisted Caesar but have agreed to come on board. And Cicero looks out at them and says, you know, we did this, and we need to take responsibility for it. And things cannot continue to be what they were before. We can't go back to a world where it was aristocratic factions fighting for power. I mean, he doesn't say this in so many words, and it's a complicated speech, but, um, but not that long. If anyone wants to read it in translation, it's a fascinating capsule. But, but he, he stands up, he says, I haven't spoken for a long time in the Senate. I haven't been able to speak in public. Um, speech itself has been impossible because we've been living in a state of civil war, but now I'm going to speak, and, and then what he has to say, as I said, is about admitting responsibility for you know the awful violence of the previous decade uh, it's just I, I it's impossible for me to imagine a politician standing up in the senate now and looking at syria looking at the middle east looking at you know iraq and saying not just you people were responsible for that mistake but you know we all colluded in and had a part, however big or small, we can argue. You know, we can argue about that in what's happening in this part of the world. And the first thing we need to do is is acknowledge that, because without that acknowledgement, we're never going to be able to think together. No one's able to do that now, because it not just for political policy reasons, you know, that are immediate, but I think because of this deeper, um, deep, deep reluctance in American public discourse to acknowledge failure or mistakes. So read more Cicero, I would say, <laughs> <laughs> who for all his, he loves to boast and make, make a lot of himself, uh, but in, in subtle but clear ways, you know, acknowledges his, his errors too. That I think of Aeneas too in the, the Aeneid um, as, as a figure who's, who's, uh, whom a lot of people dislike when they read the Aeneid because he seems so unheroic. But that seems to me Virgil's brilliant solution to this problem of, you know, arrogantly and, and confidently founding an empire, but at the same time having a 
uh, your, your founder figure be reticent, not arrogant, not confident, always unsure of himself. I think that Virgil really had his finger on uh, that, what I'm calling kind of characteristically Roman awareness of that make one misstep, everything could go to hell. 